چون شم دکی مام خسنه بلیک نبا کردن اینشتاینی C K R لویس پارتنری رامن تی ساوبر بس آمریکش آمریک آششوس پسیانی که قبل دبیس رگولر بیشه سخب. So next speaker is Gordon Einstein, partner at C K R Law, and the name of the topic is Understanding USA Securities Law. Please. Where is Gordon? Just a moment. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Testing. Okay, good. Thank you. Which one goes which way? Pull it back. Yes. And where do I point? Folks, I'm pushing a button. Okay. How's everyone doing? Yay. So I can judge my audience. What's the English level between one and 10? 10. I love it. All right, fantastic. All right, I am what they call a mobile speaker which means despite that camera being there, I'm gonna come down, I'm gonna walk around, we're gonna make this interactive, and we're gonna have a good time with it. This is US securities law, which can be fun and exciting. I, I'm seeing a lot of unconvinced faces, but we'll work on that. So we'll give it a shot. Um, my name is Gordon Einstein. I'm an attorney from Los Angeles, California. All I do is blockchain and crypto law, that's it. And of course, included in that is securities law. If you want a copy of this deck, I'm happy to share it. Please add me on LinkedIn and send me a message. You can even add me on Facebook if you want. But look up Gordon Einstein on LinkedIn, and then every slide from this one forward will have a link on the bottom just in case you want the deck. So you're welcome to take pictures, but you might as well have the deck. It's going to be on the footer of every single page because this has happened before. It's like the Matrix. Okay, let's see here. And I always have to say this. I am not with the SEC in case anyone was confused. Okay, if, like I said, I'm a sort of a fast-talking Los Angeles attorney. If this goes too fast or you want me to go back over something, Raise your hand and say, hey, bu hey, buddy, slow down. It's not a problem. And you can ask questions. And this will be interactive. Also, I want to point out that SEC means the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. No one in the US says SEC. So always say SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. That's the main agency in the United States that regulates securities. And securities, just to make sure everyone understands, are in essence investment contracts, like stocks, like bonds, like several other things that generally warrant regulation by the government. So it's not like a house that you're buying that's going up in value, there's certain kinds of investment contracts. There's two other terms I really like. There's FUD. How many people have heard of FUD? I like it. I like Georgia. I went to Korea. I said FUD. Blank faces. FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Many people avoid doing ICOs and selling tokens into, into the United States because of FUD. But then they realize that everyone there wants to buy tokens and wants to invest in ICOs. So then they have FOMO, 
FOMO is fear of missing out. So when you see FUD and FOMO in Instagram, you know what those mean. And I always have to say this, I'm a lawyer, but I'm probably not your lawyer. So legally I have to do that. Okay, so let me gauge the audience. Who in the audience, just raise your hands, is or has invested in crypto, either currencies or tokens? I like it. Um, who here is actively involved directly in a blockchain project? Great. Who wants to conduct or be part of an ICO? Who doesn't want to admit being part of an ICO, but is going to do it anyway? Well, someone raised their hand. That's interesting. It's good that the camera's going this way. Uh, who here is concerned about US securities law? Okay, very smart people. Good, you should be. Now, here's a kind of trick question. Like I mentioned, the SEC is the prime, is the regulator in the United States when it comes to securities, i.e. investment contracts. Does the SEC have the right to say that every token is a security? Is that within their power? Raise your hand if you think the answer is yes. The SEC can say that. Okay. Raise your hand if you think the answer is no. The SEC cannot say that every token. Okay, interesting. And by the way, when people, part of the reason I go around the world speaking on this topic is you see every point of view on Facebook and, every, and LinkedIn and everyone's such an expert and they're really sure about what the SEC can or can't do. I will clear up the FUD so that you don't have any more FOMO. Here's another one. Who thinks that the SEC has the power to ban all ICOs in the United States? Yes? And who, raise your hand, thinks that the SEC doesn't have that power? Who's not gonna raise their hand no matter what I say? <laughs> of course, Mike, buddy, Kuna, rock on. All right, all righty. Now, this is a long presentation. There's a lot of information. I'm going to go fast, but try to be clear. But this is the essence of securities law in the United States and really everywhere else. And by the way, I did not get permission from Disney to use that, okay? But there you go, all right? The key is don't lie. It sounds basic, but that's where everyone screws up. So just to take a step back, I'm gonna be discussing securities law in the context, I mean, we're, we're not here for that specifically, we're here for that to understand how it relates to ICOs, how it relates to tokens, how it relates to selling these things into the United States, into United States investors, how you can do it safely, how you can mess it up. These are all important things. And one recurring thing I hear going around the world is, oh, we're not gonna do our ICO in the United States. It's too dangerous. Well, nice try. China, as most of you know, has currently banned ICOs, initial coin offering sales. The US has not. The two biggest economies on the planet right now are the US and China. If you fail to access those two sources of capital, that may be right or may, that may be wrong, but your competitor who comes on the scene one week after you, who figures out how to access that capital, even though you may have a first mover advantage, they can leapfrog over you because there's so many parties in the United States that want to invest in crypto and ICO that there's millions and millions of dollars available for startups. So it, I suggest you can't avoid it. Also, when done correctly, an ICO is not just for raising capital, it's a marketing event. It's a community building event. You wanna get people excited about the project. It's not just initial coin sale. Well, if you're not getting Chinese or Americans excited about your project, you're dealing with a much smaller world in terms of customers, and adopters of your technology. So it's worth understanding the risks and the benefits and what's available. So for the, and also I'll point out that a lot of other countries base their securities law on United States law. They do it in one of two ways. They either copy it because they think it's a good idea or they purposely don't copy it because they wanna achieve an advantage against a law that they think is kind of backwards. So if you understand the US point of view, you can either see who's copying that structure or 
you can look for those jurisdictions that have made some intelligent choices to be a little bit different and identify the benefits there. So the essence of U.S. securities law is don't lie, don't commit fraud. And fraud has a very technical or specific, I should say, definition. A lie, when it comes to this kind of law, is a material misstatement of fact that would influence a reasonable investor's decision. I'll say that again, a material misstatement of fact that would influence a reasonable investor's decision. Okay, so if I'm talking to grandma about EOS and I say, the sky is green, well, I'm lying. This guy's actually not green, but it doesn't matter because it's not related to EOS. It's not material. It's not going to influence her decision. Uh, if I say, let me just, the founder of NEM, I don't even know who that is, but if I say, if I say the founder of NEM has, you know, has dreadlocks, okay, it's not, it may be a lie, maybe about NEM, but no, well, hopefully, no reasonable person will take the dreadlocks into account when making a decision. So a material misstatement is something like, suppose you have a token representing real estate, and you claim that your token is backed up by a billion dollars worth of real estate, when in fact, you don't have anything. Well, that's clearly material. It's related to the investment that's in question, and any reasonable investor would surely be influenced by the difference between having no real estate backing up your token and having a billion dollars of real estate backing up your token. Okay, that's a material misstatement, a relevant fact that would influence an investor decision. Now, here's the tricky one, and here's where people kind of get messed up. There's, actually, before I get to that one, there's lies of exaggeration. Suppose you have, you say you have a billion dollars of real estate, but you really only have 750 million. It's not quite as bad of a lie as the first one, but you're still really in the danger zone. Right? You want to watch exaggerating your statement, you know, something, saying something like you have a fully developed MVP or you have all these great advisors when you really don't. You know, if you're kind of on the way to an MVP, like you have an alpha or beta but not a full MVP, that's sort of a lie of an exaggeration. That's good. That may influence an investor's decision and cause fraud. Here's the tricky one. It's a lie of omission. What if you say, I have a real estate token, and that real estate token is backed up by $1 billion worth of real estate. And that's true. You're like Donald Trump, used to be. You have $1 billion worth of real estate, and you just leave it at that. Well, suppose like Donald Trump, you have $1 billion worth of real estate, but you owe $10 billion. Well, if you don't say that you owe $10 billion, and you only say that you have own a billion, you didn't actually lie with your words but you lied through omission. You left out a relevant fact that was required to allow an investor to fully understand your initial statement about having a billion dollars worth of real estate. So watch out for lies of omission. If you're gonna say the truth, say the whole truth. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut. Any questions about what I just said? So all the SEC regulatory actions that you read about that are scaring people, I shouldn't say all, 95% of them involve fraud. Someone lying proactively or misstating. Okay, the SEC is not super hard going after situations where people made honest mistakes. They may be asking them to take back their transaction, but they're not, neither them nor the FBI at the moment are bringing criminal charges. So just tell the truth. Okay, here's another one. Remember that I asked the audience whether or not the SEC can take the position that all tokens are securities? Or and whether it does take that position or whether it can take that position. The SEC, unfortunately, was not clear for a long time, but now it is being clear. It has come straight out and said that not all tokens are securities, and of course, not all ICOs involve fraud. Now, to me, this is obvious. I mean, not all tokens are securities. You can have a token representing anything, all right? And a, and a security is a defined term. But the SEC, because 
I think they were, didn't understand what was going on or they wanted to protect people, weren't clear. And so all these self-appointed experts on Facebook said every token's a security, the SEC says so. No, they didn't actually say that, but they were vague and unclear. And the US lost a lot of business as a result. So the SEC came up with a nice website, sec.gov slash ICO. And I love this first part. And this is sort of like lingo, legal English. ICOs can be securities offerings. You know what it means when you say something can be? You mean it can also not be something. ICOs can be security offerings, i.e. they also cannot be security offerings. ICOs based on specific facts may be, another good word, may be securities offerings and fall under the SEC's jurisdiction of enforcing federal securities laws. Maybe, may not be, based on specific facts. And that's the actual law. If something's a security under the definition of a security, which we'll get to, the SEC has what's called jurisdiction. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay, the SEC does not regulate shoes in the United States. Okay, if it's something's a shoe, they can't say it's a security. They can't call a duck a spider. Right? A thing is what it is. All right. And then the chairman of the SEC actually got up in front of a university and said, of course not all ICOs are fraudulent. Well, thanks, you know, a little late, but that was okay. That's Jay Clayton, he's the chairman of the SEC. And just keep in mind, the United States commissions have chairman. Or, there we go. And this is a fake ICO website that the SEC put up to educate people about what fake ICO websites look like. So it's actually pretty cool. They called it Howie Coins. Now, who's heard of the Howie case or the Howie test? Come on, let's do cardio. Raise your hand. Good. Okay, so the SEC had a sense of humor. They created a fake ICO website, which I have to say looks better than 90% of the real ICO websites I see. So if you want a really good ICO website, hire the SEC to do yours. And they went through the usual things. A white paper that was bogus, promising high investment returns, like a million percent per second, which, you know, it's hard to maintain, I think. All this fun stuff. Anyways, it's worth checking out. Okay. Let's dive in a little bit deeper. And again, I'm using Mickey Mouse without permission, and I'm glad you're recording that, sir. That's going to be used against me later. All right. We'll go into more details, but the SEC is what's called an independent agency of the U.S. federal government, the national government. What does that mean? It means it's not part of a department. For example, we have the Department of Defense. We have the Department of the Treasury. In countries outside of the English system, you have usually ministries. Same thing. The SEC is an agency that is independent of any department. The Congress meaning the, the lawmaking body of the United States, passed two laws that are the core of securities regulation in the United States. There's the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. And they said in Congress, we're a bunch of old guys, and they were mostly guys, we don't understand this stuff. We're gonna create an independent agency that we delegate, i.e. authorize or deputize, to regulate securities on our behalf, subject to certain rules. So the Congress has the right to, to regulate securities. They said, this is too complex. What the heck is going on with this stuff? It's like tokens. We, we don't understand. They created this new agency called the SEC, and they said, SEC, pursuant to these two laws, technically the Exchange Act of 34, you're created. Congratulations, you exist. Now, regulate securities for us. But if you get out of line, meaning you go beyond the letter of the law, or you break constitutional law, eh, 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 they kick you back, or we'll kick you back. And the SEC said, thanks, what's a security anyway? Luckily for all of us, a security is a defined term. And all these self-appointed experts on LinkedIn and Facebook and everywhere else don't know what the heck they're talking about. If you wanna see what the SEC can regulate, go to the, the 33 Act, it's all on, you know, the internets. And look at section 2A1. Now, section 2 is very useful. It's the section 2A, rather. It has a long list of definitions, things, terms that are used in the law. And the very first definition, of course, is what the heck is a security? It's a long list, but it's a usable list. Security means any note, stock, treasury stock, 
profit sharing agreement, yada, 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 investment contract, which is important. All these things, if it falls within this list, it's a security, and the SEC may have jurisdiction. If it doesn't, then it's not a security, and the SEC has nothing to say. Just keep in mind, there's other agencies and departments in the U.S. government. If the SEC goes beyond securities, those agencies and departments go, no, that's ours, not yours, back off. For example, the SEC does not have the ability to declare war. That's the Department of Defense or the President. Actually, it's the Congress. Right? The SEC does not have the right to impose taxes. That's the IRS. The SEC only can do securities. And here's a little tidbit. Commodities, gold, silver, and futures on commodities, or are, are not securities. Okay. There's a difference between commodity and security. Now, just there's no right or wrong answer to this. Who thinks that Bitcoin is a commodity? Raise your hand. Lasha raised two hands. Everyone, this guy is the future president of Georgia. Okay. Who thinks that Bitcoin is not a security? You just voted against the future ex president of Georgia, just you know. Um, the answer is we're not sure, but it's definitely it's more like a commodity than a security. I mean, there's no Bitcoin Inc. that has yearly profits and a board of directors. It's more like gold that you mine out of the ground and then you trade. All right. So now here's the, the section that gives everyone a hard time, and I'll go into more detail later. Included in the definition of security is an investment contract. What the heck is an investment contract? The reason that was put into the act was before these laws were passed, all the 50 states in the United States, or most of them, had their own definition of what a security was. And the courts in all those jurisdictions, all those states, had decided cases trying to figure out what's a security and what's not a security. I mean, some things aren't securities. That orange is not a security, and I'm going to use that in a, in a moment. So when the Congress put in the term investment contract, they were saying, since we don't have a clear definition of what a security is and what it isn't, or new things come around all the time, for example, tokens, we're going to have this bucket category, this broad category called an investment contract. And if something functionally is a security, then it will be an investment contract, therefore be regulated by the SEC. But of course, they didn't actually define what an investment contract was. That was decided by a later case called Howey that we'll go into. Okay, now, that was a little prelude. So let's again put the SEC into context. The key to understanding any U.S. law is understanding the U.S.'s constitutional order. The core document, the core law in the United States is the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution provides for different levels of government. There's the federal government, which is the central main government of the United States. Then each of the 50 states has its, their own government. They're not provinces. They, they have basically home rule. They're semi-independent in a way. And the balance between the federal government, the, the national government, and the state government is determined by the Constitution. The Constitution also breaks up the federal government into three branches. There's the executive, i.e. the president. There's the late legislative, which is the Congress, what makes the law. The executive theoretically carries out the law. And then there's the judiciary, which is the court system. And at the top of the U.S. federal court system is the U.S. Supreme Court. And whenever there's a dispute between the states and the federal government or between the branches or between an individual citizen and a federal agency or personage, it gets handled by the federal courts. And if things get appealed or contested, the issue at hand can rise up all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And whatever the United States Supreme Court says is the law, is the law. That's going to be very important for Howie. Okay, because Howie, here's a preview, is a U.S. Supreme Court case that set up the definition of what an investment contract is. So all around the world, when people are trying to figure out whether or not a token is a security, what they're really doing is applying the Howie test, which is a U.S. Supreme Court case. It involved this gentleman named Howie versus the SEC, or maybe it's SEC versus Howie. And it decided, kind of once and for all, what an investment contract is. Now, here's a little bit of history. 
it used, you know, it's kind of strange. The US has been around for over two centuries now. I mean, from a government perspective, it's kind of old. But we only had national securities laws in 1933 and 1934. Securities Act of 33, the Securities Exchange Act of 34. Why? That's kind of weird. I mean, there were securities before those two laws. Back in the day, securities regulation was a state law issue. Each of the 50 states, or most of the 50 states, had their own laws regulating securities. In fact, Kansas, you know, like where Dorothy came, comes from, you know, Wizard of Oz, Kansas, which is all just fields and scarecrows, had the first securities law in the United States. The reason is that all this New York money was reaching out to Kansas and cheating all these poor farmers out of their hard-earned funds. And Kansas said, you can't do that. We're going to regulate securities. After Kansas passed that law in 1911, think about that, 1911, which is 22 years before the federal law, many, but not all, U.S. states put in their own securities law. And there was a huge amount of disagreement between all the different states in how they regulate the law, the securities law. Now, think about that with tokens. All, you know, tokens are tokens. Or an ERC-20 token is an ERC-20 token. But every country on the planet, it seems, has its own different law regulating what the heck you can do with these things. That's kind of like the United States before we had federal law. There's a lot of parallels. So when you, you have the system of state law, because things were inconsistently regulated, we had something called the Roaring Twenties, where everyone got crazy, invested all their money in securities that had no disclosures and no information about them. That led to the stock market crash in 1929, which led to a trade war with European countries, which led to the United States stop lending money to Germany to pay off its debt from World War I. Germany's economy fell, fell apart, the Nazis came into power, and you have World War II. So when people tell me that securities regulation is just a pain in the butt, it doesn't really matter, think about this. Stock market crashes, US goes into depression, to try to save jobs, it raises tariffs. Every country in Europe does the same. You have a trade war. What became, what was a US depression becomes a worldwide depression in the early 30s. Germany doesn't have money to pay off its debts, crashes, the Nazis take over, and you have World War II. All because of a lack of securities regulation. And that is not really an exaggeration. So, I'll kind of skip ahead here. In reaction to all this, the federal government finally put into place the 1933 Securities Act and the 1934 Securities Exchange Act. Right? Now, pause for a moment and notice how strange, it's kind of odd that the U.S. has two laws that are the core of its uh, regulation, not one. I mean, most every other country on the planet has one core securities law. Why does the U.S. have two? Well, the answer is they were a little bit busy because the whole country and the world was falling apart. So they couldn't do all the law at once, they had to do it in parts. The 1933 Act, which I'm, so if I can, ba, 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 ba. let's skip ahead here. I am gonna skip ahead. Da, da, da. The 1933 Act covers the initial sale of securities by the issuer. In other words, when a company is selling its stock or its bonds for the first time, or for example, a startup is conducting an ICO for its first time, it's covered by the 1933 Act. What happens after that, for example, what happens on exchanges, or what happens when a private shareholder sells securities to another private shareholder, or the law involving broker-dealers, which are people who facilitate sales and securities, that's all underneath the 34 Act. So the 33 Act is the initial sale or issuance of securities and the 34 Act is everything that happens afterwards. That's why you have the Securities Act of 1933 and Securities Exchange Act, Exchange of 1934. Now, that's a lot of text. Let me kind of lay it out for you. Some states in the U.S. before 1933 and some countries then and now look at securities that someone wants to sell and pass judgment about whether or not that security is a good or bad investment. Hmm, is this company good? Does it pay enough dividends? You know, do we like the management team? In other words, they're making a merit evaluation about a security. They're trying to decide on it on behalf of the investor whether or not it makes sense to buy that security. 
Thank God the U.S. and most countries doesn't do that. The whole point of the 33 Act and the basis for U.S. law and really the basis in the world for the world is they're not trying to decide whether or not a security is a good investment, except in cases of fraud. But they're not trying to decide whether or not you should buy this thing. They're just making sure that there's enough information published by the issuer that an investor can make an intelligent and informed decision. In other words, it's a disclosure requirement, not a merit requirement. So when Elon Musk says, I'm going to start you know, a rocket company, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, right. If he's selling his stock, the SEC doesn't judge whether or not Elon Musk can really start SpaceX. It's just making sure that Elon Musk gives enough information to the public so that the public can make up their own mind, which is a good thing. Because if the, if the government was in charge of figuring out what stock would or wouldn't, what company was or wasn't going to work, that's communism and that doesn't work. Right? They, I do not trust the U.S. government or any government to figure out what company is going to do well in 10 years. So the basis of the 33 Act is disclosure. So it covers the initial distribution, i.e. the first sale or issuance of a security, which is a defined term by the issuer, which is the company doing the first sale, to the public. And the default rule in the United States, the default rule, and this is what, this is what scares everyone, is that unless there's an exception or an exemption, the requirement in the United States is that every single security being sold to anyone in the U.S. needs to be registered, registered with the SEC, and that includes filing something called a prospectus. Now, big public companies, Apple, IBM, Google, and I'm maybe dating myself a little. Okay, when they went public, they registered with SEC, and the SEC worked with them and fought with them to get their disclosure documents, their registration statement, and their prospectus perfectly compliant with the law. And those companies went public. They sold their shares to the public and become public, became publicly traded companies. This is obviously a slow and expensive process, registering with SEC and filing prospectus. And then when, once you're a publicly traded company, the fund doesn't stop there because under the 1934 Exchange Act, not only do you have to comply once, you have to keep on complying. You have to file quarterly statements, yearly statements, comply with certain laws, comply with a law called Sarbanes-Oxley. It's generally not something that a company wants to do until it's quite big. When making sales of securities to the public makes sense. So everyone's like, oh my gosh, we don't want to register with SEC. No, you, you don't. Luckily, again, thank you God, <laughs> there's lots of exceptions to the registration requirement. It is like Swiss cheese. It is full of holes. And those holes are there intentionally because the Congress and the SEC knows that 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not appropriate to have to register every little security. There's lots of exceptions or exemptions, and we'll get into those. If you're thinking about doing an ICO or an IPO, sorry, an ICO, into the United States, you can raise money from private investors under, under certain conditions, not register with the SEC, not file prospectus, and not have to comply with all of the ongoing reporting requirements. Just the main idea, again, is you don't commit fraud, either th proactively or through omission. Okay, so. I'd, I'd like to point this out. Remember I said the Section 2A of the 33 Act is all the definitions, starting with 2A1, which is the defini definition of a security? There's a section of the Act that no one looks at, but I think is great. It says that the SEC's mandate, a mission, is not just to protect investors. It's not just to protect grandma. The U.S. Congress in 1996 added Section 2B, and it says that the commission, when it does rulemaking, shall, that means it must, it's not can, it's not may, shall consider whether the, the action will promote efficiency, competition, and capital formation. In other words, the SEC, by law, has a mandate where they can't just get in the way and cause problems and be annoying. Under law, when they make rules, they have to think about the U.S. economy and the functioning of the markets and promote efficiency, competition, and capital formation. I think there's no argument that ICOs and blockchain at least have the potential to improve or facilitate efficiency, competition, and capital formation. 
And I actually, quite in front of a room of people with an SEC person on the stage, made that point, and I heard two golden words, which is, you're right. I was like, I knew that. Okay, da da da. By the way, I normally get this over four hours, so I'm kind of bopping ahead here. Da, 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 da. Okay. Now let's get in the nitty gritty. And again, I'll share this deck with anyone. It's not a trade secret. So add me on LinkedIn and ask. Okay, let's get in the nitty gritty. What is a security? What's an investment contract? What's the Howey test? What is the Gordon securities test? By the way, like I said, I'm not with the SEC. You can't rely on the Gordon securities test, but it's good to know. And is it a security or is it a pencil? We'll get to that. Ba -ba -ba. Okay. Remember, a security is a defined term. It's a defined term in the 33 Act and it's a defined term in the 34 Act. It's that long list of things. Shares, bonds, notes, investment contracts. And when it comes down to it, the SEC and lawyers and governments don't care what you call something. They call what something actually is in real life. They look at the economic reality. They look at the substance of what you're doing. So if you test shares in a company and you don't call them shares, you call them ducks. Hey, SEC, I'm not selling shares to the public. I'm selling ducks to the public. So the securities law don't apply. The SEC will laugh at you and go, ha ha, nice try. Okay, you can call this thing whatever you want to call it, but in real life, it's a share. So it's a security, so we're, we're going to regulate it. Because believe me, no one is so clever that they're the first one who came up with the idea of calling something by a different name just to avoid regulation. So when do you take your security and go, no, it's not just security, it's a token. The SEC laughs at you and they say, you know what, we've heard that one before. Last year you said duck, this year you said token. No. What the SEC and all the courts and everyone are looking at is the economic reality, the substance of what you're doing. Now, every once in a while, something happens that's new. I'd argue that tokens and blockchain and ICO are new. That doesn't mean that the law doesn't apply, but you're not just renaming some old thing trying to slip by. There's a real question. Are token securities? I don't know. Are they? We, we, we don't know. How do you figure it out? Well, you need to find out whether this bucket concept of an investment contract applies. Okay, so again, definition of a security includes investment contract. Why is it there? I explain this. Okay, the Howey test. So the US Congress and Roosevelt passed the 33 Securities Act in 33, obviously, and the Securities Exchange Act in 34. Both of them had a definition of security. Both of them included investment contract in that definition, but they did not define what the heck an investment contract is. So everyone was struggling until 1946, 13 years later, when the US Supreme Court came up with the Howey test. Now, what, there's nine judges who sit on the US Supreme Court. And the Howey test, think about this, is deciding ICOs and token and securities law today around the world. Now, here's a trick question. What do all of those nine judges have in common? Anyone? They're definitely lawyers, what else? Those 1946 Supreme Court judges, what do they all have in common? Say again? Maybe. I see an idea for me. No, oh, here's the answer. They're dead. Okay? These nine dead dudes wrote a case in 1946 that in 2018, where I'm sitting here in Georgia, in Tbilisi, I had no idea this was going to happen, by the way. You told me three years ago. Okay? These nine dead dudes, and they're all dudes, are running US and global securities law. What's with these nine dead dudes? Well, until we have something better, these nine dead dudes made the law that governs what the heck a security is when you have an uncertain situation. So you thought I brought this up here just because I was walking into the room late and you know, had this in my hand, right? Well, that's true. No. Okay, this is an orange. Hey, okay, there you go. The case, Howie, SEC versus Howie. Howie, this poor guy, owned some orange groves, land divided up into parcels where they were growing oranges, orange groves. And it's right by a really nice ritzy um, resort. And these wealthy New Yorkers would come down to the resort and they go, you know what, I want to get back to nature. Let me go frolic and play in the orange groves. I love picking oranges. This is fun. This is what people did in the 40s. 
And Howie, smart guy, said, you know what, Mr. City Slicker, how about this? Since you love oranges so much, buy some land, we'll take care of the trees, we'll pick the oranges for you, we'll sell them, and we'll give you some of the results. This is a land maintenance contract, okay? Since you love oranges so much. And, and of course, everyone, like, they, every time they buy a condo goes, or timeshare goes, this is great. I'll come to these oranges on my weekends and pick them and enjoy them. Of course, no one really does that. They go once or twice and they forget about it, right? So Howie was selling these contracts, these land maintenance contracts, where they said, you know, hey, you own, you own this, or, this, this orange plot. We'll pick the oranges and we'll sell them for you and we'll give you some of the money. The SEC came down and said, you're not selling oranges. You're selling securities. You're selling investment contracts. No, I'm not. I'm selling oranges. Yes, you are. Let's see how we blah, blah, blah. Lawsuit, lawsuit, lawsuit. Appeal, appeal, appeal. Finally, it ends up in the U.S. Supreme Court. And the question is, is what Howie was selling an investment contract? It wasn't a stock. It wasn't a bond. It wasn't a note. But is it an investment? Is it a security that falls within the definition so that the SEC has jurisdiction? Because if it's not, if it's an orange, that's a commodity. Okay, if it's something else other than an orange because of the relationship that they formed, now all of a sudden it's a security. So the SEC figured out the Howey test. If you take anything out of today, take this. There's a four-part test to deciding whether or not a token, anything, is a security. Each one of these parts must be true. If any one of them is not true, it's not an investment contract, not a security, so the SEC cannot ban it. Unless you're committing fraud. And again, that's the exception to everything. So with those people who said the SEC can ban any token, no. The question is, does that token, when you apply the Howey test, are all four prongs true? If any one of them is not true, it's not a security. It may be a commodity, but it's not a security. Okay. Is there an investment of money or value? Okay. If I'm giving people gifts of oranges... I don't want anything. Well, maybe I want something for you. No, here's an orange. Here's a gift. Okay. Is that a security? No. Give me that back. Was that a security when I took it back? No, I'm a jerk, but no. Okay. You'll, you'll get it again. Okay. Um, just play along. I know it's you. Can I sell this to you for 100 grivna? Okay. Now, there's a, would everyone agree that there's an investment of money there? Oh, here. I have 100 grivna, I really do. Was there an investment of money? It's not a trick question. Yes, okay, good. By the way, there's not a trick, give me that back. Okay, so now, does that by itself make it a security? Okay, why? It's a commodity. Yes, yes. Well, let's say an exchange of value. The investment's a little bit of a loaded word, you're right. Let's say, is there payment of value? Is there an exchange of funds? Okay, good point. All right, and I always tell people, be care if you think your token is not a security, do not use the word investment in your documents. So it's a good, it's a good point. Actually, I'm going to change that slide. Thank you. Okay, but if I sell this, to this uh, token, yeah. if I sell this orange to Mike here for 100 grivna, and we just exchange it, is that a does that by itself make it a security? No, of course not. I mean, it's not like everyone's selling oranges all day. It's selling securities. By the way, with all this stuff, just pause for a moment and don't get hyper-technical. Just think in real life what's going on. Okay? If it's, you go on the street and you buy an orange for some money, you're not in a securities transaction. Okay, is there an expectation of profit? Here's where it gets, things get exciting. One more time. Um, since you're good. I'm going to sell you this orange for 100 uh, Canadian dollars. I don't know. I, just, uh, I won't be nationals. You should buy it because soon it'll be worth 120 Canadian dollars. Do you believe me? Really? Well, we should do a lot of business. Okay. Now, there's an expectation of profit there. If you read the actual Howie case, it's interesting. It doesn't say expectation of profit. It says led to an expectation of profit. Led to an expectation. In other words, it's not what this person's point of view is by itself. It's did you, the seller, create that expectation in that person's mind. So if I had just done what I just done, and sir, what's your name? 
Lawrence. And Lawrence thought in his mind, ha ha, that fool. I know that that 100 uh, Canadian dollar orange is really worth 120. I'll buy it and I'll resell it. Ha, that silly attorney from LA. And I didn't say anything to make you have that point of view. You may have an expectation of profit, but I did not lead you to an expectation of profit. Now, everyone around, everyone around the world kind of makes a mistake on this. And they think it's because there's just an expectation of profit. If you look at what, in cases where it's not clear, the courts and everyone else really look to, how was that thing marketed? How was it sold? What was the understanding of the parties? In other words, they look beyond the orange and they look at the communications around the orange. That I somehow, as the issuer, induce someone to have an expectation of profit. Let's see what it is right here. Okay, in a common enterprise. That's a tricky word and that's defined by a lot of cases, but basically, is there some group of people or economic interests consciously or intentionally acting together to make something happen? Well, when you have a company like IBM or Google or whatever, it's pretty clear you have a common enterprise. Now, here's a question. Is Bitcoin a common enterprise? All right, so whoever said yes, give me the, give me the reason for the yes. One more time, please. I appreciate you. So let's do that from now on. So, I'll, but I'll repeat back what you said. Uh, you, you believe it's a common enterprise because many people are involved in transactions in Bitcoin, mining, acting as nodes, and that's producing a result. Yes. Now, what the word "common" means is that there's some element of coordination or common purpose or alignment or contractual relationship between these groups. So I would argue in the case of Bitcoin, no, because all these parties, though they may know about each other, and they may not even know about each other, they may be acting together in a market, but they're not necessarily acting to support each other. In other words, the miners in China are not acting in, in a common enterprise, let's say with the miners in Georgia. They're acting in a competitive market where everyone's trying to win over everyone else. That's not a common enterprise. So when you're saying with IBM, where you know, all the IBM employees and all the stockholders and everything else are working together, that's a common enterprise. Bitcoin, and the SEC kind of said this, is not. Now here's the trick question. Next person. Is Ethereum a security? That said no. SEC said no, right? You know, when you say sec, it sounds a little risque. You, you got to be careful because that word's... Okay. Actually, the SEC did not say that. One, one guy who works for the SEC gave that opinion. So just be careful. But it would be very bad if the SEC went against with that... Un the person who said that was not the chairman of the commission, nor commissioner, nor was there a ruling. But that kind of stuff doesn't happen by mistake. It's an example of how the U.S. kind of shadow regulates without being real clear, which is unfortunate. Okay, now someone, why would Ethereum be a common enterprise? Just throw out a reason. Say again? Or, so which company runs Ethereum? Well, that's a, that's a nonprofit foundation in Zug. But you're, you're getting to the issue. I'd say it's an edge case. Because between Vitalik and the foundation, and what happened with the DAO, where it's not really that dis distributed, it's not really that decentralized, because some guy or group of people was able to override what happened in the past, which is showing that they really kind of do have a common enterprise. Maybe it's a security, maybe it's not. You can argue that the DAO was sort of a one-time thing, and what's happened since then is Ethereum is really distributed. It's really decentralized. Vitalik and the foundation may have influence, but they don't have control. So I'd say it's an edge case. So when you're this, this analysis is helpful because when you're looking at a token, just because you have blockchain, just because you have a token, unless you build in decentralization, unless you build in uh, making a distributed app, it's probably going to be something like a common enterprise. I mean, if you have one company selling tokens and they're running the whole show and they keep control, that sounds like a common enterprise to me. And the profits come primarily through the efforts of others. In other words, if I'm an employee or I'm a salesperson and I'm earning a commission, not a dividend, but a commission, okay? That's not a security because I am working for my payment, right? A security is more like I buy a stock, I sit back, and the company makes money for me. 
So going back to Howie, if those people who had bought the land actually went out there and picked their own oranges, that's probably not a security. But what they did is they bought that contract, they went home to New York, and they got profits through the efforts of others. So again, all four of these must be true. If you want to be Boolean about it, each one of these needs to be a one, and none of them can be a zero. Here's the Gordon Securities Test. I say that if you take a security and break it down, it involves at least the following components. It's either a claim on profits or, and or it's a claim on cash flows, i.e. interest payments, or it's a claim on assets because the value of the assets are going up or because if the company gets liquidated, you're going to have some amount of the, what's left over once all the parts get sold or governance relating to any of the foregoing. If you look at any security, whether it's a bond or a stock or investment contract, somewhere in there somehow, there's either a claim on the profits, i.e. dividends, a claim on the cash flows, i.e. an interest payment like a bond, a claim on the assets, meaning the thing becomes valuable and the stock goes up in value, or if it gets sold or, or liquidated, there's some cash there, or the rights to govern any of the foregoing. I challenge anyone to come up with something that's a security that does not have any one of those four. If your token does not have any one of those four, a claim on profits, cash flows, assets, or governance, again, I'm not your lawyer, but I will double dare you, double, double bet you that the SEC cannot say that that's a security. Think about that. Okay, I'm gonna use my favorite example here. So, this is a pen, not a pencil, but can we agree that it's a pencil for the moment? Please, please, please. Okay, thank you, someone said yes. Normally in the audience is like, no. And thank you. Okay. Remember the part about led to an expectation of profit. So let's do an exercise in common sense. Okay. Is this pencil security? The answer's on the board. This is a risk-free answer. Is this pencil security? No. What is it? Thank you. You all played along. I appreciate that. Okay. If, I'm, if I go, hey, I'm selling this pencil. It writes real good. Okay. Is it a security or is it a pencil? Okay, who says security and were you being cute or not? Silence, good. Okay, now here's the tricky one. This pencil is good and it will go up in value because this pencil is a scarce resource and, and um, yeah, it's gonna go up in value. You should really buy it. Is it a security? It can be, you're, you're getting into the gray zone, why? Because I took this silly thing that's a pencil and I started to market it I, like it's a security, I created an expectation of profit. I, I led you to an expectation of profit. In this case, I'm clearly full of it. I'm lying. So not only, not only is it maybe a security, it's possibly securities fraud. All right? What happened? I mean, the pencil's still a pencil, but it's the words around it. It's the expectation of the parties that changed what it is. So if you look at the, what the SEC is doing, and you wrap your head around the idea that how people market this stuff affects how they act, it all becomes clear. Now, who's heard of Munchie? Okay, Munchie was this ICO happening in Los Angeles, and I no pity and despise the attorney who worked on it, okay? I'll even gender her. She, and not because she's a she, wrote a white paper explaining how the, the token was not a security under Howie, and they marketed it. Well, nice try, because actually the white paper proved that it was a security because it created an expectation on the profit, a profit on the behalf of the buyers. In other words, the white paper marketed the token as if it was a security. If they'd just not done that, maybe it wouldn't have been. Okay, now, we're all in this token world. If I tokenize this pencil, and that's it, don't add facts. If I tokenize this pencil, is it a security? Is it a security? No, good. Can everyone see the screen? Can anyone not see the screen? Is everyone became, all right, zone in silence, I guess, okay. Simply tokenizing something does not make it a security. Tokenizing pencils, oranges, diamonds, no, okay? Simply tokenizing does not make it a security, okay? Unless, of course, you falsely market it or mark, you know, falsely or otherwise market it as a security. So all these tokens that represent assets that people are selling Unless the underlying asset is a security, 
And unless they're marketing this thing incorrectly as a security, it, that by itself does not make it a security. Okay, now what if I what if those tokens become exchangeable, like on Kuna or elsewhere? Seeing if he's paying attention. Okay, what if you have exchangeable tokens? Do you have a security now? Not clear. Okay, it's an edge case. Now, I would argue that assets become more valuable when they're exchangeable. Okay, the reason that we all drive want to drive cars is because we can get gasoline. Right? If the, if gasoline wasn't exchangeable then cars would not be valuable. So when something goes up in value because it becomes useful, I'd say that's not really profit, it's just usability, utilities increasing. But when all these companies that are doing ICOs talk about listing their token on exchange, the argument is they're creating expectation of profit on behalf of the buyers. That's why everyone's being careful about discussing their plans for listing on exchanges. All right? So it's just watch your step. It doesn't automatically make it a security. Okay, now here's kind of the Gordon test. If you take a pencil and you add in a, what I would call it a pencil enterprise interest, in other words, dividends or cash flows interest, assets or governance, do you have a security then? Yes, because you're not really selling the pencil anymore, are you? You're selling this kind of new compound object that includes the pencil, but also includes some other stuff. And that other stuff is an investment, probably involves investment money, common enterprise, expectation of profit, all that other stuff. So when Howie was selling the oranges, was he really selling oranges? No. What Howie was doing was selling a contract that related to oranges. And the way that those contracts were being marketed by Howie was that you could make some money buying these contracts. So Howie may or may not have understood what he was doing, but he's like, well, I'm just selling oranges. What, what's the problem? Wrong. Howie was selling some underlying asset, but wrapped around it was a contractual relationship and marketing. So you can have a token that by itself is not a security, wrap around it an enterprise interest, wrap around it a contract, wrap around it the way you market it, and you just magically took your token and turned it into a security. So optics, marketing, what you say matters. Legally it matters. Okay. So again, I, want to say, I just want to repeat that. Tokens can be transformed from being not securities into securities when you wrap around them certain investment characteristics or, or marketing, right? Now, there's all these, I'll just say it, stuffed shirt, kind of arrogant securities attorneys who like to cite this or that case where they go, you know, the Washington Supreme Court in 1952 decided that whiskey barrels are securities. So watch out and go hire me. Everyone goes, oh no, whiskey, uh. And someone else goes, you know, beaver pelts were found to be securities. And you know, uh, interest in real estate and condominiums were found to be securities. Okay, they're really trying to fool you. Okay, what's really going on if you read those cases is the underlying asset in most cases wasn't a security but someone built a contract around them that provided dividends, interest payments, increase in the assets or governance of those things, right? So don't fall for it. Is that clear? Yes, yes, okay. Now here's my favorite one, I believe. Oh, oh, oh. Actually, I'm going the wrong way. Now. What if you have an initial pencil offering, otherwise known as an IPO? Who's, who, you, know, you have an initial pencil offering. Uh, let me wrap this one up and then, yeah. Okay. Is this a security by itself, this pencil? Just by itself, good. If I sell it to the public in an initial pencil offering, is it a security? Let me hear someone argue yes it is. Let me hear someone argue no it's not. Who's, who can take a yes? Argue yes. Once you get the mic. Yes, I do. Uh, the holder of the magic microphone speaks. Give us why if I sell this pencil in the IPO, an initial pencil offering, not public offering, but pencil offering, is it maybe a security? You got the microphone. You take it for someone else. Come on, pressure, pressure, pressure. Can you say again? Okay. It, all right. So the question was, and then I'll, you're, I think you're on track. If I take this thing that's not a, a security and I sell it to the public 
an initial pencil offering or IPO. Dear public, I'm conducting an IPO. It's an initial pencil offering. Get them now. They write real good. You would think pencil. Initially, it would be. Hmm? From the from the beginning, it would be. Because. Because you're offering it as an investment. I am. It's initial pencil offering. But that's what my impression would be. Right. Okay. Good. You're on track. Why is your impression that? Because you want to uh, take money from me and give me something in return on that. Well, I, I, could, I can do that with an orange. I can sell it to you for a dollar. Well, that's what we wrapped our heads around it as an IPO, which means... Right. You got it. Okay. IPO in the public mind is initial public offering. It's what you do with securities when you're doing the first sale of them. People buy securities in the IPO because they want to make money when that security goes up in value. If I'm being cute and call it an initial pencil offering, wink, wink, you know, pencils, not, pu not public, get it? The reality is that some grandma out there is going to be fooled because I'm using a term that people understand to be related to securities, and I'm sort of marketing my pencil like it's a security, even though it's not. I'm using a confusing term, and I should know better when I'm selling these things to the public. Now, here's a... Right, you're leading to an expectation of profit. You know how IPOs make you money? Well, this IPO will make you money too. I mean, <coughs> I mean pencil. <laughs> okay, now, here's the punchline, then I'm going to wrap it up. Think about the term ICO, initial coin offering. What does that sound like? Initial sounds like initial public offering. Oh, no, I didn't mean public, Your Honor. I didn't mean public, SEC. I meant uh, uh, coin. That's it. The, the, way, the fact that they sound the same have nothing to do with each other. No, forget it. You didn't say it. Okay. I love the term ICO, initial coin offering. It sounds cool. It sounds sexy. Why? Because it sounds like ICO, and it kind of rhymes. Okay. It's, okay but the, the reason people are switching to this freaking token generation event, which sounds horrible. I mean, what the heck is that? I didn't go to law school to do TGEs. Is because... They're avoiding the term ICO because they want to be careful about mismarketing their non-security token as a security and getting people confused. And when they go and stand in front of the judge, it looks bad to say you're doing an initial coin offering. No, 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 Your Honor. It wasn't an initial coin offering. It was a token generation event. Oh, thank God. Get out of jail. Okay? So, okay. Again, that's marketing versus your marketing. It's like a weird Heisenberg effect. It can change the nature of something from a non-security to security. I'm at my time limit. I appreciate it. And you know what? Because you're awesome, have an orange. <laughs>